Hi everybody and welcome to the last video in this particular series on Othello and we're going to be looking at Act 5 Scene 2 in this video. Now I might do a few more videos just to develop your knowledge of particular characters across the whole play if that's helpful for people but this is the last video where we're going to be looking at the play kind of line by line. So in terms of the plot, we've seen the murder of Desdemona, we've also seen the murder of Amelia, and now we're at the moment where Othello should have some kind of anagorisis, where he should have a realisation of what's happened, and then we see the punishment of Iago as well. So our big question for today is, is there a sense of res resolution and restoration of order at the end of the play? We would normally expect something like that at the end of a tragedy. Of course, Shakespeare often doesn't give us that resolution and restoration. Um, and I'm thinking about a, a particular production of Macbeth um, in Stratford-upon-Avon that I saw a few years ago with Christopher Eccleston in the lead role. And at the end of that version of the play, the witches reappear and the character Flayons comes on stage holding a sword and it looks as though the, the chaos and the bloodshed is going to continue on to future generations. And what the producer of that play did was exploited the instabilities, the questions, the little problems at the end of the play which are not often ignored as people think, right, everything's done, people who are uh, need to be punished or dead you know we kind of know what happens and someone else is being given the throne and control of the country so it's all good um, some um producers as i say question that and I, i'm going to question that a bit in today's video because i'm not sure that we do get a full sense of restoration of order at the end of othello so um desdemona's dead amelia has revealed the truth about the handkerchief and so on and so othello should have a moment of a nagorisis now i might pronounce that word incorrectly um within my school there's a bit of debate about how you do pronounce that particular word um but what it means is a moment where the scales fall from someone's eyes where they're not blind to the truth anymore and it links back to a play by Sophocles called Oedipus Rex, in which Oedipus has this hideous realisation um, that he has killed his father and he's married his mother. So it goes right back to Greek tragedy, which is why it's a Greek word. So Othello has this possible moment of realisation, his understanding that Desdemona was actually innocent. And he says, behold, I have a weapon. A better never did sus itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. So... He pulls out this sword or dagger from somewhere and he says this is a great sword and when he says it's a good sword he's reminding us of Act 1 scene 2 and 3 when we've heard of what a great warrior Othello is and so in Othello's mind he's travelling back to that time when he was respected by people, when he was in control, when everything was going well in his life. And he says, I have seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword, I have made my way through more impediments than 20 times your stop. So he's saying that this sword has really helped him um, in battles, you know, fighting impediments there. He means um, fighting soldiers who are in his way from the opposite army. So he's recalling better times and the times when he was really noble and he could be described as being a hero. And then he pauses and he says, oh, be and boast. Who can control his fate? Tis not so nigh. So when he was a hero, when he was a soldier and leading the army in actual battle, he felt like he was in control of his fate. Um, a little bit like Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 2 of that particular play. But here he has a, a realisation that actually sometimes people can't control their fate. Sometimes things are inevitable. And this brings us to one of the central tensions in the play. Is Othello realising the truth here or is he still deceived? What we've seen is that in some ways Othello's downfall is inevitable because Iago has kind of decreed that it will be such. However, there are so many points in the play where things could have gone a different way, where, for example, Amelia could have revealed the truth earlier, or Othello could have listened to Desdemona, or he could have realised that he loves her so much that he can't kill her. And there's so many of those little moments that make us question the idea of fate and think that actually free will is a more dominant concept. So here, when we look at this line, who can control his fate, we've got to ask ourselves, is Othello trying to abdicate from his responsibilities? Because actually he 
killed Desdemona out of his free choice, didn't he? He became jealous out of his free choice. You know, there's no sense of gods or supernatural forces controlling things in this play in the way that there is in Macbeth, where we do have a sense that the witches, it could be argued, are controlling what Macbeth does. Here, we don't have that supernatural influence. It's a, it's a very human play. So we could argue that Othello is trying to say, actually, this death wasn't really my responsibility because it was I was fated to do this. It was a supernatural force. But that doesn't really hold water in terms of the ideologies and the ideas that we've seen in the play. So whether Othello's and Agorisis is complete or not can be argued because maybe he doesn't realise his full responsibility in what's happened. And then he says, here's my journey's end, here is my butt and very sea mark of my utmost sail. So he's going back to some of the seafaring imagery that we've seen elsewhere in the play. And that is where we do see the idea of fate, because a current in a sea, um, as you'll know if you've ever kind of um, gone bodyboarding or surfing or something in dangerous waters, the current is very strong and you cannot control it and the current will pull you where it wants to go. So we do here get a sense that actually everyone's life is set on a particular current and you travel through it, you can't control it and you reach your destination. And we've seen this image a few times in the play as well. So this idea of fate and free will, whether Othello is realising, yes, I was fated, and that's true, or whether he's trying to um, refuse his responsibility for the free choice that he made, is a really debatable one, and it's one that you should explore in your essays. So he progresses and he starts talking about Desdemona here and he says, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven and fiends will snatch it. So he's imagining here that when he dies, he won't be allowed to be in heaven because his soul will be sent down to hell because of the hideous act, the hideous crime that he's committed. And then he says, called, called my girl. Notice the possessive pronoun there. He still thinks that he owns her in some way. The diminutive girl. So... Again, we can question his anagorisis. He realises that he shouldn't have murdered her. He realises that he'll probably go to hell to be punished because of this. But at the same time, he doesn't acknowledge the living, breathing, wonderful, determined, forthright, outspoken, brave, courageous woman that Desdemona was in Act One. He calls her a girl. And so this is again, uh, revealing his lack of understanding of Desdemona's character, continues. So we could say, is this an agorisis complete? Possibly, you could argue that it is, or possibly you could say, well, he still doesn't understand the woman that he married, which has been his problem all along. And then he says, oh, cursed, cursed slave, could be referring to Iago, could be referring to himself here. And of course, the two characters have become so similar in Act 5 that it's sometimes difficult to tell them apart. And then he's imagining the punishment that he's going to go through in hell, the winds, the roasting in sulphur and so on, the gulfs of liquid fire. And we've got a very visual, concrete understanding of what hell and punishment is here. And so Othello seems to think that he's going to get his kind of rightful punishment in hell. And then he really laments the fact that Desdemona is dead and he's lost her and he's got a really profound sense of grief here. So this particular speech is... On the one hand, a moment of realisation about what he's done, about how awful it is, about how he should be punished. On the other hand, it's him saying, well, I was fated to do it, so it's not entirely my fault. It's him not entirely acknowledging the person that Desdemona really was, and, and he doesn't realise that actually one of the reasons that he's arrived at this place is because the foundations of that marriage were so precarious because they didn't know each other. We see that in Act 1, Scene 3. So then, a little bit later in the scene, Othello has another speech and he says, I've done the state some service and they know it. So he's going back again here to his service as a military leader and how much the state of Venice owes him. So he's almost saying that, yes, I've committed this heinous crime, this terrible act, but in some way it is offset by my loyalty to the state of Venice. 
and then he says i pray you in your letters when you shall these unlucky deeds relate speak of me as i am nothing extenuate nor set on aught in malice so he wants people to describe him as he really is to tell a story of othello truthfully and to not exaggerate anything or say anything wrong because people feel badly towards him but what what is the truth of the story you know that that's the problem in this scene is the truth that Othello was faded? Is the truth that he acted out of free will? Is the truth that it was all Iago's fault? Or should Othello take responsibility because he chose to believe Iago? Is the truth that actually the marriage was precarious from the very beginning and that's the fact that they don't know each other very well has led them to this point? So that truth isn't quite so easily expressed as, a, as, a, as Othello seems to think it is. So then he says, then you must speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well, of one not easily jealous, but being wrought perplexed in the extreme. Okay, beautiful lines, very romantic. But is this true? Is this real? Is Othello actually having a real sense of anagorisis here? He says that he's not easily jealous. Well, I think the actions and the deeds of the play show that actually he is easily jealous. If we take a few steps back, in Act 1, Scene 3, he asserts that he's married a woman who loves him because he's told wonderful stories. And he loves her because she loves him. That's not a good foundation for a marriage. He doesn't know this woman. He doesn't understand her. He doesn't recognise her individuality. And then as soon as Iago says anything about Cassio, Othello believes him almost straight away. And he, he demands ocular proof for the affair, but he believes in it before he demands that ocular proof. So when Othello says he's not easily jealous, he doesn't have a true understanding of his own personality, his own character and the human condition. So again, we could argue that whilst he realises that he's been tricked, he doesn't realise his own responsibility in this situation. And then he says, he describes himself with this simile as being like the base Indian threw a pearl away, richer than all his tribes. So you might be familiar with the biblical phrase, throwing pearls before swine, um, as in you give something that's incredibly precious and you just throw it away and you, you reduce it, you debase it, you, you destroy it really. There is a question over the word Indian in this quotation and whether it should be Indian or whether it should be Judean because obviously lots of things were handwritten or printed um, and the quality wasn't necessarily the same as it is today. So it could be a misprint that lots of versions of the play say Indian instead of Judean. Now, if it's Judean, that's really interesting because we know the character of Judas from the Bible and Judas betrayed Jesus to his death. So is, again, Othello using this very self-aggrandizing language, as we saw earlier in the scene, to compare himself to the biblical story? And the adjective base is really interesting as well. This is a realisation, isn't it, that he's debased everything, that he's destroyed everything, he's twisted his marriage with Desdemona and he's ruined it and he's become as bad as Iago. So there is a realisation there. Um, and then at the end of the speech, he says, he tells people, this is the story I want you to tell about me. Say besides that in Aleppo once were a malignant and a turbaned Turk. So he realises there that he's got this level of, of malevolence within him. Where this malignant and a turbaned Turk be a Venetian, as in Iago, and traduce the state, I took by the throat a circumcised dog and smote him thus. So at the end of this speech, the phrase circumcised dog, this animalistic language, could refer to himself. It could probably equally refer to Iago. Um, but Othello is, does, does kill himself with his dagger in this scene, as well as attacking Iago in this scene. So there is increasing level of violence and Othello does commit suicide. So looking at the character of Iago then, um, a little bit earlier in the scene, jumping back a little bit, Othello says, will you, I pray, demand that demi-devil why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body. So he wants people to ask Iago, why did you do this? Why did you trap me? And we see again, is there a little bit of an abdication of responsibility here? Othello is blaming Iago. He's saying that he's been trapped by Iago, kind of mind and body. 
that is true but also does he need to take responsibility for what he's done as well because he chose to believe Iago and Iago says demand me nothing what you know you know from this time forth I never will speak a word and this is why Iago's character is so cryptic and frustrating and interesting because he refuses to speak so he silences himself at this point in the play and although Iago describes the play we never get an answer about why he's done what he's done. And we've spoken about the motivations that he might have had in previous videos, you know, whether it's racism or misogyny or just an innate malevolence that prompts him to want to destroy everything that's good. And Iago is here asserting a great power, isn't he? Not through words, as he's done earlier in the play, but he's asserting his power through his silence. So, yes, we have a sense of resolution in the idea that Iago is going to be punished. Um, and tortured at the end of the play but we lack resolution because he is still in charge here and he's still calling the shots um, and you know manipulating people in his refusal to speak rather than in his willingness to speak earlier in the play. Very last speech then the final lines of the play Ludovico sums everything up and he says oh Spartan dog so he speaks to Iago here he calls him a dog echoing Rodrigo's words from Act 5, Scene 1. And so there's this realisation here that Iago is evil, malevolent, debased, he's animalistic, he is the true kind of villain of the piece. And Ludovico refers to the tragic loading of the bed, so the death of Desdemona and Amelia, and he puts that at Iago's responsibility. And then he says, this object poisons sight, let it be hid. So the idea of poison we've seen as a motif all the way through the play, how poison can pervert, twist somebody's mind, how they can, how poison can kill in a metaphorical psychological sense as well as the literal poison that Othello wants to kill Desdemona. Now what's interesting here is that Ludovico is saying this object poisons sight, so even though everything should be resolved, everyone that's dead you know, everyone that's been attacked has died and Iago is going to be tortured. There is a sense that all of the people who are in this room who survive the bloodshed are in effect poisoned and they're going to leave this room with this poison within them. So there is an indication here that maybe things are going to continue beyond the end of the play and that the root problem of racism and misogyny hasn't been dealt with and therefore that poison is going to continue. And then Ludovico says to Gratiano, keep the house and seize upon the fortunes of the Moor for they succeed to you. So he says, Gratiano, you're going to inherit the Moor's fortune. He doesn't have any descendants, therefore you can get it. But look at the fact that Ludovico uses the word the Moor. So this is what I mean by the poison continuing. We still have the poison of racism in that term that's going to continue beyond the end of the play. Everything that Othello and Desdemona's marriage stood for, the challenge to the racism of society that that marriage symbolised is negated here, it's destroyed because Ludovico still uses these quite racist terms to dehumanise and take away Othello's identity. And then he turns to, to um, Cassio and he says to you Lord Governor, so he's saying Cassio you are now in charge, to you Lord Governor remains a century of this hellish villain, the time, the place, the torture, oh and force it. So we know that in the future Iago is going to be tortured by Cassio, which seems to be, you know, poetic justice. It seems to be that a character of morality such as Cassio um, is going to be able to punish an immoral character. But of course we remember that Cassio is maybe not so moral as he often presents himself to be. We know how badly he treats Bianca and how misogynistic and um, dismissive he is towards Bianca. So are we really comfortable to have this particular person as head of state? You know, so these are all questions that complicate the idea of the restoration of order at the end of the play. And then Ludovico ties everything up with a nice couplet and he says, myself will straight abroad and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relate. So this nice couplet is supposed to kind of tie everything up, seal it off, you know, this is all dreadful, I'm going to tell the state, but everything's been dealt with and sorted now. But maybe it hasn't. Is Othello's anagorisis real? Is Iago still in control and powerful in the sense that he doesn't speak? Is Cassio the correct person to give the governorship of Cyprus to? 
is the poison of racism and misogyny going to continue beyond the end of the play? So these are problematic questions that quest the, the question that that problematize that complicate the idea of the restoration of order at the end. So a final independent learning task for you then. I have put my plot summary on the screen in front of you. You will notice that I haven't sealed off that final bit nicely. I haven't, you know, finished off the diagram properly because I want to leave you with the impression that there isn't necessarily a sense of order, that the, the story of Othello isn't complete and that it lives on beyond that final scene. So what I suggest to you is you could screenshot this and print it off or you could copy it down yourself, add a description of the plot to each picture and a key quotation to each picture just to consolidate your knowledge of the whole play. So thank you very much for listening. Let me know if it's been useful for you and if you have any questions you can pop them in the comments below.